We will we'll find some spare balloons for those people who've had a few mishaps. Um, I have been passing out straws. You may find that those help with the inflation. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is we resist the temptation of the balloons just for now um, because uh, we need to complete the, uh, the program of speakers first of all. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce now the presidents, the current president of the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, John Zarnecki, who lives along the road in Burlington House. Uh, that's where the RAS is based. Well, I not, wish. not quite live I there, wish. but you know. Um, <laughs> but you take my point. Um, so I'm delighted that John has been able to join us to talk about uh, exploration. Thank you, John. 1707, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for the introduction. Uh, as Don Polacco said earlier, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And for both him and myself, it's uh, the first time that we've spoken in this uh, eminent uh, place. Um, I was amused by Stuart's comment earlier about the BIS, which he implied was very old because it was founded in the 1930s. I would just point out that the RAS is 198 years old. Uh, and in fact, have to grudgingly admit that this organisation, the Royal Institution, is some 20 years older than, than, than us. Um, anyway, let me just... Uh, bef thank you. I imagine that will go on for the next 30 minutes. So. <laughs> just a few words about my background. Um, I've been very privileged to have been involved in space research for about 35 years. And uh, I started with launching sounding rockets in Australia. Uh, that gave us about five minutes of observation time above the Earth's atmosphere. Then I got involved with uh, a strange project that you've probably never heard of. It was called the Large Space Telescope. And I was part of the team that built the faint object camera for what became known as the Hubble Space Telescope uh, later on. And then I worked on Giotto, uh, to Comet Halley, uh, the very early days of Rosetta, Beagle 2, and then Cassini-Huygens that you've heard a bit about, and that took uh, nearly 20 years of my life. Um, I, I also, I should just say, because I've been put on after the astronaut, thank you very much for that, Stuart. Um, <laughs> I, I can't, you know, uh, claim any of the great achievements of, of the, that we heard about before, However, I think I do have a claim to fame, which I think is unique in this country, because I'm a three times failed astronaut, meaning I applied three times to be an astronaut, and I was rejected three times. And I don't think anybody else in the UK can claim that, probably. <laughs> um, and however, however, I have been on the ESA vomit comet, you know, the, 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 the um, Airbus, which dives down over the Bay of Biscay. And I did 31 parabolas, so 22 seconds of, of microgravity uh, each time. And I was not sick once, so I'm very proud of that. So that's me. OK, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about space science. And uh, I realized during the talks today that this slide is wrong. I should really have said three reasons to go into space to do science, because of course we've heard from at least two speakers about y using space for microgravity, for doing experiments with growing crystals and growing plants and human physiology and all that sort of very important science. But in, in our strange world, we don't call that space science. Uh, so the, the, what I call space science, well, there are two reasons that we go into space to do it. One is to get above the atmosphere and the effects of the atmosphere, and I'll say a little bit about that. And the second is to go to what I would call interesting places. And in fact, I'm going to mostly talk about the second part, because uh, half an hour is, is, is not quite long enough to do the universe, which I think is what was described in the program. You need a bit more than 30 minutes for the universe. So first of all, about the, the blanketing effects of the atmosphere. So this is a plot. I think I'm not going to show any equations, but I do like graphs. OK, so this graph or this plot um, along here is essentially wavelength. 
So this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum from very energetic to very unenergetic. And up here is the amount of radiation at that wavelength that is absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere. So I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but the important thing to notice is that for most of the electromagnetic spectrum, the atmosphere blocks out most of the radiation, which is a, a nuisance if you're an astronomer, because it means that most of the information about the universe is, is lost to us. But speaking as a human being, it's actually quite nice, because without this uh, property of the atmosphere, we wouldn't be here. The atmosphere, of course, keeps out all that nasty stuff that wouldn't do us uh, any good. So uh, here we have gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet. That is all essentially blocked to us here on the ground. We've then got the, this, what we call a window in the visible part of the spectrum, and obviously we can see the stars and the moon and the sun, but even there, uh, something like 5% of the radiation is, is absorbed. Then we have these little gaps in the, inf in the infrared part of the spectrum, and then another window in the radio. But most of the infrared and low-frequency radio is blocked to us. So, going to space, offers us the opportunity to study this radiation uh, from the universe. And, and really, most of what we know, I would say, now about our universe comes from observations made on the ground, but much of it from space over the last 50 or 60 years. In fact, it's even more complicated, that, well, not complicated, more subtle than that. You know, I've said we've got a window in the radio and the visible, but with this wonderful machine that I've already mentioned, the Hubble Space Telescope, that operates in the ultraviolet, which, as I've said, is blocked uh, to, uh, from, uh, to, to us here on the surface, but also in the visible. And you might ask, why on earth go to all the trouble and expense of putting a telescope into space in the visible part of the spectrum when clearly we can observe uh, that from the ground? Well, this slide, I hope, shows why so on the left is an image of a particular binary star made with the Nordic Optical Telescope, uh, which is a telescope which is essentially the same size, the same aperture as the Hubble. And, and this is the same a binary system with, with Hubble. And you don't need a degree in maths or even to be an astronomer to see the difference. OK, this shows you that even though light passes through the atmosphere, the atmosphere is, is like a, a blurry lens. So even under the best conditions, the light is, is somewhat blurred. So, so uh, going above the atmosphere, and the Hubble is only orbiting just over the rooftops, really, just to get us uh, away from this atmosphere, we get a fantastic improvement uh, in, in, we call it, resolution. So... Um, this is a slide from, from ESA, and it shows a whole range of missions across the electromagnetic spectrum. It's the other way around from the previous slide. So this is gamma X, ultraviolet, through to, to microwaves and radio here. And this is a whole range of missions which have either been flown, are, under, uh, are flying now, or under development either ESA-led or ESA and uh, uh, other agencies. And it shows you that we have essentially covered the electromagnetic spectrum from space with these wonderful telescopes. And we've learned so much from either uh, up here and the gamma ray and X-ray. We tend to be looking at very hot, very violent, very energetic places, you know, black holes, accretion disks around black holes, clusters of galaxies, very hot material, through to here, the infrared and the um, uh, radio, where conversely, we're looking at the cold universe. So for example, regions of star formation, where, where it's very cold, but material is beginning to come together to form stars. So. That was one of the reasons, but I'm going to concentrate now in my remaining time on the other reason, which is about going to interesting places. 
So first of all, why do we bother to go when with fantastic telescopes on the ground, we can see a lot of interesting places? And I think we saw this slide earlier, maybe from, from, from Abby. Um, this is uh, an image, well, that's from, uh, of Mars from, from the Hubble. And this is typically what you can do from the ground. And, you know, those are pretty good. And you can see some features. You can see, uh, you can see the, the polar ice caps there. And you can see variety in, in the surface of Mars. But I've just picked a random image from, this is from Mars Express, which is orbiting Mars at the moment. And just, just look at the incredible detail you can see from an orbital vehicle. I mean, it's hardly surprising if you're just a few hundred kilometers above the surface. Uh, just in this one image, you know, you see impact craters. You can see a clear indication that, uh, that water once uh, flowed or liquid once flowed on the surface of Mars and all sorts of fabulous geology. And of course, we can go further and we can land on the surface of, of planets, Mars in this case. We heard about the, the rover which is being built here in the UK. This is one of the NASA rovers. And you know, if you're a ge geologist, this is just wonderful. You can, you can read an enormous amount. Oop. The buttons are very close together. There we are. Um, an enormous amount from the stratigraphy of, of, of the layers there. And th this is something that I love. This is from, I think, the, from Curiosity. And so this is a series of, of, of stills put together to form a movie. And you can see what we call dust devils, these little convective vortices dancing across the surface. And, and with my colleagues, I've written a few papers on these dust devils, which we think are very important and might trigger the global dust storms uh, on, on Mars. So I'm now going to go through, and really it's a bit of a random walk through some of the interesting places that we've been to in our solar system. And uh, just to give you a flavor for what we've done, um, and just a few words about what we might do, though the next speaker is also going to concentrate on, on the future. I should also say that when we go to interesting places, it, there, there are lots of things you can do, different things you can do. And they're sort of listed down here or shown over here in this little uh, schematic. So in order of simplicity or, or getting more difficult, we start with a flyby. And if you look at the history of, of space research, you'll see that in the early days, we were mostly talking about flybys because guidance and so on wasn't very good. So it was all you could do to, to fly by Mars or Venus at 100,000 kilometers or so. But then as we've got more sophisticated, we can go into orbit. And then, particularly if there's an atmosphere, we can put in a probe to go down through the atmosphere. Uh, if there's a solid surface, we can land on the surface. If we're really, really clever, we can then rove about on the surface. And then in, in, in a couple of cases, we've even uh, collected a sample from the surface and brought it back to the Earth. So let's look at a few of the places that we've been to. And these are my sort of personal selection. So let's, starting uh, closest to the sun. So this is Mercury. And this is not quite what you would see with the naked eye. It's actually a superposition of a visual image and a map of the elemental con um, uh, concentration, the concentration of material, of elements on the surface. So different colors represent iron, aluminum, uh, etc. Et uh, it's important to realize that we do a lot more than take images. Images are very important and you can tell an enormous amount from them, but we do lots of other things. So this is done with an X-ray spectrometer. So Mercury being so close to the sun, it's bombarded by energetic particles from the sun, which generate X-rays in the surface. And then we can analyze those X-rays and uh, allocate different elements. Uh, to them. Another thing about Mercury is that you see it's absolutely pockmarked with craters, 
which means that the surface is, is very old. There hasn't been much going on there to modify the surface. OK, this is uh, the surface of Venus from one of the Venera probes. So the Russians had a whole series of, of, of Venera probes from the mid-70s through to the 80s. Venus is absolutely the worst place to, to try and put a spacecraft. The surface pressure is about 90 times what it is here in this room, for example. And as we've heard before, that it can get to uh, 700 degrees uh, centigrade. So it, it, it's as close to hell, probably, uh, that we've got in our solar system. And the longest that a probe survived on the surface was two hours and seven minutes before it was either crushed or, or the solder joints melted. Just as a, as a little aside, I, I, I love this. It, it's a wonderful example of, of Murphy's Law. Um, th this is the bottom of the probe, and this is the, the surface. And it, that object there is one of the lens cap covers off the camera. So the camera is covered, and when you get there, you eject the lens cap so that the camera can work. And this instrument here is something to measure the density and the, the hardness of the surface of, of Venus. And this was deployed to make a single measurement. And guess what happened? It was deployed and sat right on the top of the lens cap. So they had wonderful measurements of the density of the lens cap <laughs> of the, the camera. You, you wouldn't... You couldn't believe that that would happen. Incidentally, Venus, though it's further away, of course from the sun than, than, than Mercury is, is, is even hotter than Mercury. And this is because it has a thick atmosphere and, 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 and it, of course, it has a runaway greenhouse effect. So it's, 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 it's even hotter than, than Mercury. Interestingly, one thing we have found out about uh, Venus is that there's an area of the atmosphere, 50 to 60 kilometers, where the temperature and the pressure is pretty much the same as it is in this room. So, you know, it's actually quite a habitable place. And, and who knows, when we go there and look in detail, we might find bugs or even more sophisticated than bugs living uh, up in the atmosphere of, of, of Venus. Do we need a surface to live on? I don't know, I'm not a biologist, but it's a, an interesting prospect, isn't it? So let's move a bit further out to Jupiter. This is data mostly, I think, from the, the NASA Galileo mission, you can see here the incredible structure of the atmosphere of Jupiter and the banded structure running parallel to the equator. What really interests me is the, are the uh, uh, satellites, particularly the Galilean satellites there, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Incredible collection of environments. Io, the most volcanically active place in the, in the solar system. Io with this bizarre surface and very probably a subsurface ocean. Ganymede, the largest satellite in the solar system, with, um, with the only satellite with its own magnetic field. And uh, yeah, that, that shows a map of the, of the magnetic field. And these are, are sort of models of what we believe these two look like inside. And in both cases, we believe there's very strong evidence for a global subsurface ocean. And in fact, Jupiter, and in particular Ganymede, is the target of a ESA mission called JUICE, which is, we selected two years ago. It's being built at the moment. It's going to go there, and it's going to end up in orbit around Ganymede. So this will be the first time we've put a, a, a spacecraft into orbit um, around a, 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 a planetary moon. Uh, moving on further out, the, one of the wonders of the so solar system, surely, and that's Saturn's rings. So this, this is a truly remarkable place, and it, it really is a natural laboratory for gravity. You can see so many gravitational effects where you've got the, the, the particles uh, in, in it, that make up the rings, you've got uh, Saturn itself, you've got the Sun, and you've got s s moons embedded within the ring. So, so a truly remarkable place. Um, and um, then moving even further out, 
we have gone to not only planets and their satellites. We've, of course, now been to comets and also asteroids. And I'm sure everybody here, uh, I hope anyway, will, will have heard of and know a bit about Rosetta. So this is a truly amazing uh, image from the orbiter of the comet CG. And uh, there are many, many images produced now. But the, the structure and the detail that we're seeing uh, on, on the surface is truly amazing. Just a, a little fact which, which sticks in my mind. Um, we, we've got quite a lot of cliffs on, on the surface of the comet. And, and that one there is probably two or 300 metres high. If you stood at the top and flung yourself off the edge of the cliff, any idea how long it would take you before you hit the bottom? It's a long time. It's, a long time. it's about five minutes. And I think you'd hit the ground at about a few centimetres a second, so you wouldn't do yourself that much harm. So a remarkable place. And, of course, we had the feline lander, um, which, despite what ESA would tell you, didn't work as planned. This multiple landing site mission was not quite what was planned. It was supposed to land once and fix itself to the ground. As we now know, it bounced. And you can see these remarkable images from the orbiter. That's, that's Philae going down. And you can even see at the one from last landing point, there's the before and there's the after image. You can see the, the marks left by the landing legs of, of Philae. So absolutely uh, remarkable and a tremendous achievement. Right, in my last few minutes, um, nine minutes, I think, I'm going to talk about... Uh, this mission, um, I have to really, because I spent so long on it, uh, I have to make the most of it. So this was uh, Cassini-Huygens to Saturn and Titan. Um, just as an aside, uh, because I noticed there are a lot of young people here, I should tell you that the fact that we're leaving the EU doesn't mean that we're leaving ESA, the European Space Agency. So, when in a few years' time, when you're old enough, you can still go and work for ESA. We're, we're a member state, and it is really through ESA that this country has the opportunity to do all of this fantastic space science. So, you know, I, I, I do recommend you uh, looking at, at working with ESA. So, Cassini-Huygens then was a joint project between the two agencies, the large Cassini spacecraft, and the ESA contribution was this flying saucer type of thing sitting on the side of Cassini, and its target was uh, Titan, which w Voyager 2 flew by and showed was completely covered with this orange uh, smog, orange, orange haze. We had no direct evidence of what was uh, uh, on the surface. So here, a couple of images. Again, these, I think somebody mentioned, a standard uh, Airbus engineer for calibration. These are, I think, JPL engineers, but they're the same size. If they're Texan or Californian, they might be two inches bigger. But you can see you know, the size of the spacecraft. This is the most massive spacecraft ever to have been launched to the outer solar system, about six tonnes uh, at launch. This is the last time we saw it, just before it was put on top of the launch vehicle. There's the, the adapter ring. Uh, so there's a cluster of in intricate scientific instruments, 12 or 13, I think, on, on Cassini. And then Huygens there. You can see it being put together, uh, for the, 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 the uh, thermal uh, material on the front there being put together in Europe before it was shipped to the States. And that carried six instruments, of which uh, I was chosen to, to select one of them back in 1990. Despite the fact that I'd never written a single paper on the subject of Titan, I'd barely heard of it and could only just spell it. But uh, <laughs> still, they selected me. Anyway, long story. Uh, I'm sure you, you might know some of it. After seven years of designing and building it, seven and a half years of travel, uh, we were dropped overboard from Cassini and 22 days later we arrived at uh, Titan and went through this uh, sequence of uh, slowing down from seven kilometers per second 
through a sequence of parachutes, two and a half hours, we landed on the surface. To our amazement, we survived and even got 72 minutes worth of data from the surface. Um, just a couple of images before I show you a, a final uh, video clip. So these were the very first unprocessed images that we got as we came through the base of the cloud and saw this uh, uh, landscape that had never been seen before. And you can see what looked like river channels, drainage channels there, uh, quite incredible. And because I like graphs, and it, it, it's not just images that we take. So this is from the mass spectrometer. So this instrument, as we came down through the atmosphere, this analyzed the gas in situ, and you can see these different bumps correspond to various components of the atmosphere. And so many, many uh, components at very low concentration were, were identified. And this one, this, this is one of my favorite bits of data. So we, we were very worried that the probe would be destroyed when it hit the surface and that the smog might have gone right down to the surface. So it was possible we'd learn nothing about the surface of Titan. So we persuaded ESA to allow us to put something sticking through the front of the Huygens probe. And this is the flight spare. So this is, technically, it's called a penetrometer. It has a force transducer there. And the idea was that when we hit the surface, we'd measure the force with very high time resolution. And we'd be able to say something about what was there before the probe destroyed itself. And it actually worked. So that's the very first contact. That point there is where 300 kilograms of Huygens probe plowed into the surface. We might have been destroyed then. But there is 16 milliseconds, 16 thousandths of a second of perfect data where it's just like sticking your finger into the surface of, of Titan. And in fact, one of my students got an entire PhD thesis on 16 milliseconds of data, in fact, and we got loads of scientific papers. You know, we have to make the most of, uh, of what we have. Um, OK, since I've just got three minutes left, I'm going to finish off with a two-minute clip from a, the, it's the final two minutes of a, a documentary called Destination Titan, which some of you might have seen. It's shown on, on BBC4 regularly when they run out of stuff to fill the schedule with, <laughs> usually at about midnight. It's, it's, a, it's a nice programme made by a uh, young uh, filmmaker, Stephen Slater, with the BBC and the Open University. So I'd like to have shown it all to you. It's, it's, a, it's an hour long and it's, it's quite interesting. Well, I'm biased, I suppose. But this is the final two minutes, if the technology works. So that's it. Um, I've, I've got a few um, props which you might be interested in. So as I showed you before, th this, its brother or sister, is sitting at the moment on the surface of Titan, sticking into the surface. In fact, this was originally the flight model. This was originally on, on the probe, but it, it, it uh, lost sensitivity, so we had to swap it for the flight spare. So this nearly ended up on Titan. Um, and you noticed, I hope, in those images of the landing image, some, some pebbles, OK? So I, I made the mistake of telling, showing this to a journalist and saying that this was like you know, the, the, the pebbles in that surface. Um, image, and of course it ended up in the newspaper that we brought rocks back from Titan. <laughs> so that, I learned a lesson from that. But this is exactly the size and shape of, of some of those. But of course, on Titan, they're made of ice. I should, uh, Titan is an icy body. So exactly the size and shape, but made of, of ice rather than, than rock. And anybody know what this is? Comet, yes. It's not from the comet. It's actually a paperweight, but it's identical in, in dimen dimensions and some of the details to the comet. So anyway, uh, I hope uh, I've managed to keep your attention, and uh, thank you for listening.
wonder if uh, while uh, Chris sets up, I think he's going to be plugging in his computer. We have time for a couple of quick questions for John. That's okay. Mm -hmm. John there. Um, yeah, I, I think when it actually comes to it, I mean, I hope I'll be at JPL to, to watch it all happen. Um, and there will, you know, I'll be feeling quite emotional because it's been part of my life for so long. And I think as some of the earlier speakers have said, it's also about the people that you've worked with. I mean, some of them we've worked together for 20 years um, and I will also think about the people who, you know, haven't made it, because with projects of this length, you know, many, oh, well, several of the people I started with have died in, in the meantime, so in that respect, it'll be sad. But by every measure, it has been just fabulous in terms of scientific and technical achievement. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really positive. <laughs> Thank you very much okay. indeed, John.